Allowing customization of what things look like in a game can be pretty fun, but it can lead to some pretty awful experiences. I did some consulting on a game that was going to allow a lot of customization of appearances. This was a competitive game, and so various gameplay-related stats and abilities were baked into different pieces of clothing that had specific appearances to them. To paint a picture of how I thought this was going to turn out, this is what I told the developer. I said, okay, imagine a player who wants to make a samurai character, and he's got all the pieces for it, okay? He's got the samurai leg armor, and he's got the, you know, the samurai helmet. He's got a decent plasma sword, finally. And then he meets football helmet clown shoe robot, the terror of the metagame. And what happens? This guy destroys the samurai, okay? You know why that's gonna be? It's because the samurai, turns out, kind of sucks. Uh, it's just not that powerful. This mismatch, discordant monstrosity of football helmet clown shoe robot. Now, it just turns out to be way more powerful. And the forums are going to be full of complaints about this thing dominating the metagame. Lots of players are going to be calling for the football helmet to be nerfed. And they're not even going to understand that it's actually the clown shoes that really power the build. And it's really the left clown shoe that does most of the work. And then a new player is going to show up and he's going to ask which armor pieces he should be looking for. And someone's going to say, oh, dude, I mean, of course you want football helmet clown shoes, like for sure. And he says, well, are there any other options, though? And maybe the expert says, well, caveman is barely viable. And I guess you could try flower hands, but he really loses to everything else. So good luck with that. The point of all this is that a customizable aesthetic experience can be at odds with the balance and power level of the game, depending on how it all works. And you have to really care about what the player experience is going to look like. Even if it's not actually bound up with the power and balance of the game, it can still just give the player an experience uh, that feels kind of awful because everything just looks awful that they encounter. <laughs> He's back. He's back, thank God. Oh, we gotta get rid of this ring. <coughs> At least there's also a lot of cool stuff that people could make when they have this much flexibility. One solution to this issue is transmogrification or transmog as seen in the Diablo series. In those games, you can salvage or destroy a certain piece of armor and you basically extract the look of it and then you can apply that to a different piece of armor. That way, if you need to wear certain pieces for gameplay reasons to establish like how your character actually plays, what their build is, you can have it look like what you want it to look like instead of the discordant mismatch of football helmet clown shoe. That's pretty cool for Diablo and games like it, but if a game had a lot of focus on the competitive multiplayer mode, that would be a total disaster because you would see people that look nothing like what they are. It would just be really confusing. Like you want to take a look at them and know what you're up against, but you'd actually have no idea. I mean, imagine if you applied this kind of logic to a card game like Magic the Gathering, and if you could make the illustrations on any of your cards just look like any other illustration on any other card and you had to play against people who are doing that like they play some cards and then at first glance nothing is actually what it seems it would be just super confusing and awful oh and speaking of magic the gathering they are no strangers to the issue of football helmet clown shoe so in magic you can make a deck that's anything that you want and there are some forces that end up having a lot of decks have some kind of thematic coherence to them. At the very least, you need blue mana to play your blue card. So you might have a deck that's all blue. Maybe you have some cards that give a bonus to flyers. So you want to have like several flyers, maybe a deck of all blue flyers. Almost sounds like a theme. There's even some stronger themes like the tribal mechanic that gives you bonuses for playing all elves or all fairies or whatever. But of course, you can make anything you want. So what if your game has two random, pretty bad looking cards like these? And then what if these two cards just accidentally form a super strong combo that dominates the entire format? And it's the main thing that everyone sees all the time. Oops, you just invented football helmet clown shoe guy. Here's another method that some games use to try to cut down on this issue. I'll use World of Warcraft as an example. In that game, they have set bonuses of armor. So there's a set of armor that's like 
six pieces that all look coherent and then you get a bonus if you wear all six so that ends up creating the situation of at least some people like look normal and not awful also there's bonuses if you have just four or two pieces of armor usually so that allows you some customization you don't always have to have the, the whole set of armor you might have like two of one set and you know four of another or something like that which at least slightly cuts down on the whole visual cacophony of it all and also they have a few slots, usually like two ring slots and an amulet slot, where you can put things in there that do affect your build. They have a gameplay effect on your character, but they don't really show up visually. So it's a way to allow you to sculpt your build without like messing up how awful your character looks. So what they're doing there is trying to just minimize the issue the best they can. They're kind of just skirting the issue, though. I get why they did it. The Elden Ring and Dark Souls series of games have a kind of different approach, though. So in those, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of armor you can wear. And the heavier the armor is, the more protection it gives you, but then it makes it harder for your character to move and roll. And when it comes to the customization issue I'm talking about, the really relevant thing that they're doing in those games is most of those pieces of armor do not have really powerful abilities attached to them. I mean, I know there are some, but because so many of them are just stats that are pretty similar to the stats on some other piece of armor, it allows them to be actually surprisingly interchangeable. If you make things surprisingly interchangeable, you might think that you'd end up with the same football helmet clown shoes problem that we've been talking about. In practice, I think that is not that prevalent in those games, though. The actual problem of football helmet clown shoes really arises when you attach extremely powerful game affecting abilities to certain cosmetics and then players feel forced to build their character for the for gameplay reasons but if you give players free choice of what to do what we see in dark souls and elden rings is mostly called fashion souls where people try their best just to look cool and they actually appreciate the flexibility of being able to wear kind of any medium piece of armor they want if that's how they're going to build their character or any heavy piece of armor they want if they're building it that way. And yes, I know there are some exceptions. If you want the extremely powerful effect in Elden Ring of increasing your attack power whenever there are poisoned enemies around, well, you are going to have to wear the stupid looking mushroom crown. So there's football helmet clown shoes right there. So you can't perfectly fashion souls when that kind of thing is around, but at least most of the time, the powerful abilities are decoupled from the look of the armor. Another one that I think is pretty interesting is the Ghost of Tsushima. That one is kind of like the World of Warcraft example taken to the extreme. In Ghost of Tsushima, you can only wear full sets of armor. So they've sort of avoided the awful looking cosmetics problems. You can only wear a thing that makes sense. Each set of armor provides several different gameplay bonuses that are all coherent, like put together by a designer. And each set of armor forms the basis of a different kind of build. And then in order to enhance your build in that game, you have six slots that are called charms. And they're basically analogous to the jewelry slots in World of Warcraft in that they give you all sorts of different gameplay effects, but they don't show up on your character. So they don't mess up the visuals of your character at all. So what they've done in total here is to create a lot of freedom in whatever gameplay build you want, but they have restricted your visual customization to things that don't make the game look stupid. What's also a nice touch is that even though it is not a competitive multiplayer game, if you see your character, you see which armor set you're wearing, you although you don't know exactly what the build is going to be, you do have like a pretty good idea. It's reasonable to pick a certain kind of charms to go along with a certain set of armor. So you get some consistency between look and effect there. I think the reason the designers chose this method for that game is that they didn't want to restrict your gameplay builds at all, and they, and they really didn't because those charms are very flexible, but they were just very conscious about the tone of their game. Everything is so grounded in reality that they probably thought that it would just be too jarring if they allowed full customization of those armor sets. And I think that illustrates that there isn't just one single correct answer to this kind of problem. It really depends on what kind of game you're talking about. If you're talking about a competitive multiplayer game like Soul Calibur, that's really different than if you're talking like a mostly player versus environment game like Diablo. Hopefully this gives you an overview of the different issues and a few different routes to go. 
And speaking of customization, my card game Codex has a pretty different take on the customizable card game genre. It has no random packs to buy, and it's specifically designed to be interesting for a long period of time without having to release a bunch of new cards. A lot of the strategy comes from adjusting your deck during gameplay, customizing it as you play, as the opponent is doing the same thing. Players really like this game, but unfortunately, it's out of print right now. I've been working on a new version of it behind the scenes, but I'm not going to be able to release that for a long time. I don't know how I'm going to pay for the art, but I am rolling out the gameplay of the game, the important part, to my patrons over time. So you can join patreon.com slash Serlin if you'd like to see that and play it and give feedback and see how it develops over time. And you know, even Codex had a bit of football helmet clown shoes going on, but I've been able to minimize that with this new version. If you know of any games that have been particularly good or particularly bad at juggling this issue of customization of visuals as well as the gameplay effects, then let us know about it in the comments below.